Thanks, and welcome back to the 21st Century Physio Podcast. It has been a while between drinks. I think it's almost been two years since I've been on this podcast now, so I'm super excited to bring it back and super excited to have a great friend and colleague of mine, Luke Nelson, joining us today. Uh, welcome, Luke, firstly. Thanks, mate. It's uh, it's an honour honor to be on as a, as a long-time listener, and, and yeah, I think anyone would uh, would forgive you for uh, for not having anything in the last two years. It's been a pretty chaotic uh, couple, couple of years around right around the world, hasn't there? So lots of lots of stuff happening. So, but um, but excited, obviously, to be the first uh, first guest back and back with a bang. <laughs> no, there definitely has been a bit going on, uh, and there's a you know, it's a bit of a special episode today. One, like obviously, you know, good mates and colleagues. But two, you're the first chiropractor and non-physio that we've had on the podcast. I've had a couple of te- uh, technology sort of people join us previously. You're the first actual therapist from a different profession. So uh, oh. I, I say welcome and uh, very excited to hear maybe a slightly different uh, perspective on things uh, than maybe some of the, the people have been on previously. Yeah, well, it's a big, uh, big honour and a and, uh, bit of pressure on me now, so to make sure I don't, uh, I don't stuff it up and, and screw it for the, uh, screw it for the profession. So, no, a big honour to be on. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Now, I obviously know a fair bit about your background. Uh, we joined the Sports Medicine Australia board the same night. Uh, that's where we first met. I can't remember how many years ago. Probably seven or eight years ago now. Yeah, so I know yeah. a fair bit about about your background. We also just finished uh, filming the mat running new mat running course together as well. But for the people who don't know you and your background, um, do you just want to give us a bit of a rundown about you know uh, who you are and what you've done in your career today? Because there yeah, has so, been a lot. Yeah, so I, I first graduated back from uh, from RMIT back in two thousand and three. So I've been in private practice now for for a few years now, um, and um, yeah, found myself pretty early on in, in um, and I was always interested in sports when I was growing up and didn't particularly excel in anything in, in particular, but just love love being active and, and love being involved and um, just found myself uh, throughout uni getting more interested in that side of things. And then once I, once I graduated, I, I really, yeah, the sports side of things really drew me in. Uh, and uh, so pretty soon after graduating, I, I pursued some further education and, and did my post-grad in sports chiropractic and then also did my master's in, in sports science. And um, one of the things, I guess, that appealed to me at, at that time was just um, the fact of uh, there's just so much to so much to learn. So it was a real thirst for for, for knowledge. I think that set me off down that uh, down that path. And I, I pretty quickly came to realise the uh, the Dunning Kruger effect in in uh, was in, in in full effect when and uh, you know, I realised that uh, how little as I got on, how little I actually knew as uh, as it went through. And uh, um, I guess probably early in my, my practice career, I think, you know, there was the, the confidence was higher than my, my ability. And, and uh, over time, I've sort of, yeah, really yeah, tampered that down. And I think, yeah, you sort of, um, I guess you, you, you grow to accept it. And, and, uh, and I guess, you know, uh, you realise that there's certain limitations in what you can do. And that's, I guess, we're, we're building a network around you of people that you can uh, you can trust and, and tap into. And I, I've, you know, really enjoyed, obviously, my, my time of meeting people like yourself and, and um, over my journey. Um, as you mentioned, we've been, you know, we met at the, the Sports Medicine Australia, and, and that's an organisation I've been I've been involved with and, and been passionate about. It's an organisation that's, you know, multidisciplinary, so you know, it involves chiros and physios and osteos and sports doctors and strength and conditioning podiatrists and nutrition, everyone through there. And, and uh, I love that sort of in, environment. Everyone's just there to, to sort of learn and and. Um, uh, and then also uh, over the years, been involved with uh, our organisation, the Sports Chiropractic Australia, as well too. So now I'm serving as uh, as uh, president of of, of that. Um, so yeah, lots of things happening at, at the same time. And obviously, I'm a, I'm a dad and and a, and a husband, so I've got a, got a couple of kids. So I try and keep myself in in shape as well. So lots of lots of uh, balls to be to be juggling at the same time. <laughs> Very much. I still don't know how you get out and run your sort of 50 to 100 Ks per week when you're training for the marathons, mate. It's, uh, with that schedule, uh, it's a truly, uh, truly great effort. So, look, obviously, uh, I think you touched on already, education has been a big part for you and, and mm. sort of growing through the profession. Um, but going back before that, like, why did you end up becoming a chiropractor? What sort of led you down that path? Yeah, so I guess for personal personal story was, uh, you know, I was always interested. I really got into into sort of health and, and fitness um, in uh, high school in year nine. I, I did the uh, the subject theory of PE and and uh, love learning about the human body and and you know the sports side of things. And so I just got more and more into that. And then I was sort of thinking, all right, you know, would I go physio or uh, that's what I was sort of thinking at the time. And then I remember having a, a chiropractor, a local chiropractor, came and did a, a talk at a careers evening, and um, I really sort of liked what he was 
was talking about. And I thought, oh, well, I don't know anything about this. I'll, I'll go and, and, you know, I asked him, I said, oh, well, can I come and observe and, and see what you do? And and uh, he was a really, really good car and still, still is a great car. And, and um, I went down there and spent a lot of time observing him. And, and I, I did my, I had done my uh, work experience at, at a big sort of sports medicine centre with, you know, physios and doctors. And and um, I just really, I, I loved the, I guess, the more one-to-one nature that, that, that the Cairo had, um, sort of the, the diversity of different different conditions. And and so, yeah, I sort of knew pretty early on, and, you know, by year 11, that that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to do. And, and uh, I spent... Quite a bit of time observing this Cairo back in those days. Um, to get into Cairo, you needed to well, there was a minimum of uh, enter score of eighty five, um, and then there was an interview. Um, so if you got over that, then you got the interview. Uh, and um, uh, so you know the interview, a big part of that was you know what you'd done and what your, your understanding of, of things of chiropractic was. So so yeah, that sort of got me into it. And then also, I guess a bit of my own personal thing as well. I, I used to suffer from you know a lot of really bad migraines that I started getting when I was about fifteen, and and uh, and this chiropractor was also able to, uh, to to help there with those. So a bit of you know I love just that that one on one nature and and um, uh, the approach that that uh, that the he took, and and then also the results that uh, that that I saw on myself as well. Yeah, fantastic. And look, obviously, I think, you know, obviously your learning started at a young age and putting yourself out there, uh, I think uh, you've done more CPD courses than anyone <laughs> I know, I think, over the course of their career. I, I think I saw you post another one up yesterday that you'd sign up yeah, for. Like, no, yeah. Your brain. No, that's, so yeah. I'm, I'm, definitely uh, ticked off pretty much every certification out there. Yeah. What's, what's some of your favourite, um, you know, education courses that you've done over the course of your career? What have you taken away from those? Yeah, so I, I think um, it's, uh, and I, that's what I've mentioned it before. But you know, one of the things I love about about our profession is just that there is so much to so much to know and so much to learn. And I, I do have that that thirst for knowledge. Um, and I think I've been I was guilty at one point um, in my early practice career of, of doing too much. And I think that in the space of four weeks, I think I might have had a seminar on every weekend. And I found that um, it was probably yeah, you, you, you're just consuming this information. But then if you're not putting it into practice it's 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 useless so i remember looking back at that month thinking well hey i can't even remember what i did like what i cut what, what they spoke about in that seminar two weeks ago um so i i, I certainly took that on board and, and said to myself oh look i'm not going to do that again i'm, I'm going to be more selective with with what i with what i do um and but yeah i just i just love it i, I love that um i guess it's a you know a, a, i guess a constant pursuit of, of of bettering yourself and and if that's through edu- you know I, I find for me I, I get that drive out of out of educating and there's just so much to know and and you know i i would i have got no intention on being the you know the 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 know all of, of everything, but I, I've, you know, I've sort of developed a real interest in it and a passion, especially in, in terms of sports, but more specifically in terms of running. And, and I just love it. You know, I love, I love talking about running. I love, you know, doing it myself um, and, uh, you know, surrounding myself with runners in practice. And, and I think my wife's pretty happy about that because then I, I talk with talk running during the day. So then she doesn't have to hear it when I get home at uh, home at night. So, so yeah, it's sort of a, a real, you know, it's a real um, a passion, a passion of mine. And, and I think that, you know, I look back at, at some of the educational stuff that I've, I've taken over time and I've sort of, I guess, early on and still to this day, you know, identify deficits in my knowledge base where, you know, perhaps I don't know much about this and so therefore I, I go and pursue courses that, uh, that, that that fill those those knowledge gaps. Um, I think, you know, early on um, coming out of university and, you know, we did five years at, at, at uni but probably one of the things that, that um and even still to this day as well too is around rehab and, and active care and and i think that's something that that wasn't really taught that well at uni um and i think i mean i suppose to the uni's defense and, and it's still to this day you know there's just so much that that needs to be covered in that time that you can't expect to be you know proficient in everything that you do so i think as a new grad you have to come out there knowing that all right i do need to you know learn more about that but that's where you've got you know continue education to, to fill those gaps and you you go and 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 uh, you know pay for courses and do these things Things where you can become a more rounded rounded practitioner. So yeah, I sort of look back over the over the years of you know things of, of, of how things have changed. I mean, I, I guess you know uh, uh, back early on there was the you know the functional movement um, uh, system. The FMS was it was a big thing, and you know I remember doing that, and then going into you know what was then the selective functional movement assessment, and and um, you know different I suppose different approaches, and and I sort of found myself over time like I'd sort of say all right, like I like that side of things of that particular approach, but you know not so much of that. And so I sort of 
taking bits and pieces of, of things as, as I've gone along. So I certainly don't, and I was chatting about this with a student recently, but there's certainly, you know, there's not a, um, uh, a particular, you know, model that, that I, I, I do or, you know, I do this technique. It's more like, well, this is, you know, I learn all these sort of things and, and I guess this is my framework. Um, but, um, but then, you know, pretty fluid in terms of what the, the person in front of me uh, requires. Um, so yeah, it's been, been a lot, a lot of stuff that's sort of changed, changed the way that I've, I've, I've done things. I look back now and I've, you know, I practice differently now than what I did 20 years. And, and I hope that in 20 years time, I look back again and, and again, I'm, I'm continuing to improve as, you know, better ways of, of managing our, our patients come out. Now, a lot of courses, you know, you don't often take away a lot, uh, and often hard to implement to practice. What, what are some of the ones you have done that have really changed the way you've gone about uh, your practice and helped you build that framework? Oh, well, can I say the MAT course? That uh, it certainly, yeah. <laughs> um, look, at, in, in all seriousness, you know, I've got the, you've got the MAT there in the background, but, but certainly, you know, the, the, the um, sometimes some seminars can be very, uh, you know, content heavy, but there's just the lacking that the, the practical applicability of it. And it, it's the same thing also with, you know, I, I think that, and, and I've, I've been guilty of doing this as well, you know, consuming, listening to a lot of podcasts, like I, with, with my running, I listen to, to podcasts all the time. And, and um, as some of our listeners might be doing at the moment out there, but I, I, I guess the thing is, you, you, you've got to always look back at the end of that, whether that's, you know, you've done a weekend seminar, you've listened to a podcast, or you've read a, read a journal article, and you've sort of got to think that, um, you know, what, uh, how's that changed what I practice, you know, does it reinforce what I'm already doing? Or is it in conflict with what I'm already doing? And if so, is that a better approach to, to what I'm doing. So I think that, that always having that having that reflection. Um, I think probably back going back standing, you know, looking at some of the courses that have changed the way I've done things. I, I think that, you know, years ago I, I did the explain pain course with, you know, Laura Mosley and Dave Butler and and um, that was, uh, you know, we weren't taught anything about pain science back in when I finished in 2003 and four. And, you know, it was just sort of my readings that I was doing. But um, you know, seeing them face to face and, and hearing that stuff. I know you you were quite lucky, obviously, to have Laura Mosley um, going through through your university days. So there was a lot of you know pain science when, when you went through, but really when I went through, there was there was none of that. wasn't even a thing. Um, so that was probably that was a big a big uh, part of you know the thing that really changed the way that uh, that, that I approach things and sort of explained to me. I'm like, oh, well, that's why that person you know got better and why you know it's uh, um, don't even need to use our hands to you know to to uh, to, to create the these, uh, you know, these positive changes. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that was probably, that was probably a, a big one in terms of, in terms of the changing. And I'm certainly a big, uh, big advocate for, 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 you know, those seminars for, for learning about the, um, uh, you know, the biopsychosocial approach. Um, and, and then there, there, there is just so many things. I, 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 it's, it's hard to sort of then point out a, point out a, a single seminar, but look, there's, as I said, you know, the MAT course, I've, I've used that part of the, uh, in, in my assessments. Um, there's, you know, uh, running gait and running analysis, you know, the enhanced running, which I've been a part of as well and, and my sort of mentor Pete Garbett um, you know taught me a lot around that running gait uh, assessment um, then the, the rehab in terms of you know more recently some of the sports map for really dealing with those those high profile uh, you know really active populations that the rehab through there so yeah it's it's it's, it's a lot to sort of keep track of but I, I'd like to think that I'm you know it's all contributed to uh, to the practitioner that I'm I am today yeah. And what's the biggest change you've had to make? You mentioned pain science earlier, but what's the biggest change you've had to make through your career, either based on like the evidence, uh, you know, the technology or the framework that you're sort of implementing? I think probably the, the biggest, um, I reckon probably the biggest thing, the biggest change that, that happened in, and I don't know if it's since it was, I don't think it was necessarily off the back of a, a seminar. It may have been, but I can't recall, but it was probably a big switch in my career where I realised that, getting the patient well wasn't entirely up to me i think very early on it was it was sort of i was taught that you know these are my hands and i've got to fix people with these hands and and if i if they're not getting fixed then i'm doing something wrong um and it was it was actually very high pressure because you, you sort of always it's always up to you and it was great when people got well you think oh yeah i'm you know i'm the person that that uh, that that healed them but when it didn't it was then it would then come back on you and it was just like oh why aren't these people getting better what am i doing what am i doing wrong and so i think it was quite it was quite a, a you know a, a 
freedom moment really where I, I realized that well no it's not it's not to me there's there's so many things that can contribute to this person being you know in the way that they are and there was an acknowledgement of really I guess truly being holistic in in that approach and that it's not you know these these magic hands that are, that are fixing that are fixing people um so that was quite a you know because uh, it was uh, I'd, I'd say it was almost contributing a little bit to burnout it's probably the closest I've, I've, i reckon i've ever been it was just that that pressure of i need to i need to help everyone and if i'm not i'm doing you know i'm a bad practitioner I'm, I'm doing a good job whereas i think i came to realize it's like well you know i i gave the person you know the tools and they just didn't use it for whatever reason it wasn't the right time for them they weren't doing you know prescribing to that advice and and so you know they're, they're in that current state and so it was it was sort of quite yeah freeing to, to know well, the actual onus is on them to to, to get better and, and not on me um and i think that's where over time i've seen my role as being a, being an educator in, in in the patient and you know helping them along the along the journey um and you know craig levinson again sort of a guy i really look up to um you know he's said you know be be um uh, alfred and, and not batman you know so our job is not to be batman and, and try and be the hero and, and save everyone it's you know alfred who's that guide that sort of you know is there off to the side and you know helps batman out when he's in, in trouble and and um but really yeah being that so being that guide and, and not being um not being the one that has to be the superhero um i think that really uh really resonated with me when i heard that uh, heard him say that too yeah, no, I think that's yeah, obviously similar philosophy that helped us uh, start, you know, Matt and, and Strength by Numbers and, and all of the things that we've done to try and help and drive the profession forward is empower people through data to, again, take the ownership away uh, from you and put it back onto people. You're assessing movement, you're assessing capacity. Well, it's probably mm. the way you're going to go about it. That's not with the, these magic hands. It's probably mm. about empowering them to um, do some of the things that, uh, in their life to help them change. And I think, yeah, yeah just on, on that actually. No, I was just gonna just gonna say, and, and it's I guess the other thing too over time is, you know, moving into objective. You know, uh, over the years as well, having more objective measures to to look at progress and improvement. Because you know, back in the days, it was it was like oh, someone you know came in, it's like oh, how are you? You know, oh, I'm I'm better or I'm worse, and it's just like okay, you, you've just got their word. You know, you're taking them for their word, or you know what you're feeling with your hands, like oh, that feels like it's you know it's it's moving a bit better. Um, whereas you know, having something objective to sort of say, well, you, you know, your range has improved, you're doing all these activities, you're, you're now able to run 10Ks, you know, without pain, your, you know, your strength measures have gone up this, this amount. So I think having that, having that has also been quite, um, uh, quite a good step forward in terms of my, my um, uh, approach and something I've felt quite, um, quite freeing as well is to sort of have the confidence to know that you, you're doing, you, that you're on the right track with that, uh, with that particular patient, or if not, you know, you need to change and, and find another, find another way. Yeah, and look, you've helped me change that a lot recently in regards to runners and in introducing me to some new platforms, which has really changed the way that I've sort of worked with the runners and, and just looking at their data from outside what they're doing in the treatment session. Often someone come back and, you know, a good example is a patient who came in last week who came, uh, had been working for a long time. They're meeting all the objective targets for, you know, well above norms and you know, quite symmetrical side to side for their running. They came with this acute plantar fascia pain and I was sort of like, you know, what's changed? What's happened with your running? And luckily, you put me onto the Runalyze platform, which really um, helps to analyse the data of runners from their garments and those types of wearable devices. But for me, th this person had gone away and climbed um, in the last three weeks, more than they had in the last three years. Um, so obviously there's going to be a fair bit more strain and forces through there. And without that, look, that's probably coming back to me as mm. the practitioner mm. and feeling, oh, look, I haven't got this person in the right space. You know, yeah. maybe I haven't got them strong enough or flexible enough or given the right exercises. But actually... It's just something that was totally out of my control that's probably yeah. led them to be in this state. And the education part, which you touched on earlier, it really does, having that data and that approach really does allow you to open up um, the education with that person so they don't make the same mistakes again. So I think that's, that's a really right. you know, good, good point you, um, you bring up. Yeah, and that's what, you know, just even again this morning, I was having a discussion with a runner around, you know, a training intensity. You know, she's a, she's a, a distance runner and, and uh, you know, recreational runner and, and your know, typical run of it was just to do too much high intensity that just run too hard on every run. And, uh, you know, she obviously came to be injured. And uh, so we had a discussion around training intensity and, you know, showing her some of these these metrics that we'd been, you know, we'd been able to measure just with, you know, her GPS watch and, and using this, this Runalyze platform, but showing to her, you know, this is, this is what you're doing and, and this is, you know, why you're in the situation that you are. Um, this is what we need to see more of this, you know, more of this lower intensity zone running and um, and explain to her why that was. She had the visual in front of her to see that. Um, you know, again, it's like that, 
you know, playing that educator role of, well, this is, you know, I'm teaching her how to, to I guess, to self-manage and, and you know, monitor, self-monitor as well um, because in the long run that's going to be better off for, better off for her and, and uh, you know, she'll see better performances and, and hopefully, you know, less injuries as, as a result of that. Um, but that really that really excites me of, you know, I guess sharing my knowledge with, um, with you know, my patients and, and, and runners in, in specifically um, because, I, I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's serving a, a part in helping them achieve their goals and that's really my why is to, is to help people achieve what they whatever they, whatever it is that they want to do whether that's run their marathon whether it's to pb or whether it's to you know play with their grandkids um that's sort of what gives me i guess the kick of, of gets me up every morning and, and gets me um into uh, into work is knowing that uh, you know that we're trying to make these uh, make these differences and help people now going back to a topic that maybe i should have led from off the top here giving you our first uh, chiropractor on there but you talked about the magic hands and so without <laughs> moving on from that too quickly well, tell me about controversial topic, subluxations. What are they? Yeah. Do they exist? Do they, you know, do fixing them work? Do we need to, to address them? Uh, yes, I think... Thought. Yeah, it's certainly a pretty hot topic these days. I mean, just around around manual manual therapy, um, and uh, certainly our understanding and and you know within my profession and the, the, the subluxation is is something that um, we now sort of refer to more as a historical term rather than, than something that's, that's sort of existing there. I think that um, that manual therapy and i'll go right off the bat and saying that I, I feel manual therapy does have a role to play in in uh in in some patients that that's not everyone but um certainly in some and it's you know manual therapy is a part of part of what i do what i do today um the mechanisms of, of its effectiveness again is it can be varied it, you know i think we've gone past the days of of putting a bone a bone out of place into into place there again um there's a, a lot of sort of neurological and then um uh, you know other factors that are associated with with, uh, with the, the uh, you know applying any sort of any sort of therapy, but yeah, I think it, it does move away from that from the, the magic hand side of things. And and um, but you know there is the I feel that there is still a role to play in in uh, in manual therapy. And and um, I think that it's probably to the detriment of some universities that they're not you know teaching you know their their, their students at least some sort of manual skills um, because. When they get out there in the real world and patients there's there's an expectation from patients that, that that's what they're going to get um and you know it's all well and good to sort of say oh well you don't need it i'm not going to i'm not going to give it to you um but you know with paying customers they're just going to go somewhere else and, and they're going to get it and you might sort of think oh well you know it, it, it's uh you can educate and turn them around and for some that might work um but for others you know you, you you're going to lose them and and uh miss that opportunity to to educate them as you as you go so i think there's a, there's an expectation from a lot of people um especially working in, in sports as well too you know there's a there is an expectation that there is going to be you know some hands-on work that there's going to be some some rehab and, and so if you're not providing any of those things then um, you know, then you're gonna you're going to to lose those people, and and that's you know if that's that's what you'd want to do and, and who you want to work with, well then you know that that's good on you. I'm not to say that there's the a best way of, of practicing. It's just what's what sort of worked uh, work work for me. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I still you know it is a controversial topic, and I still feel that, that it does have a hands you know have some some form of hands on um, does have a, have a role to uh, role to play. So obviously you've sort of busted some of those myths around subluxations and, you know, they move you away from the, the mechanisms behind some of those techniques. But what are some of the other myths that you just wish would really move on from the, you know, the chiropractic professional or the just uh, manual therapy professions in general? I think. Look, I think it's it's uh, you know we've all got the uh, the, the stereotypical. I mean, we, we look at uh, across the professions, and you know, chiros might have the rack 'em, stack 'em, crack 'em. You're in there for you know for, for two minutes. Um, you know, the physios might have. I'll oh, just put you in there on on some uh, on some ultrasound and, and a heat pack and and uh, you know give you a sheet of exercises. They, these sort of things. You know, every profession has, has has got them, and sadly, you know, there are still you know practitioners out there that that are doing those uh, those things. But I think by and all. Um, thankfully, to the the, you know, the availability of of, uh, of continuing education, in that that there's just a general upskilling of, of the profession. Sort of everyone now is there's no excuse for not learning. You know, there's there's stuff about you don't have to even go to a course. You can just sit there in your own chair and, and watch something like you know something like you listen to a podcast or you know watch some online stuff. So there's really no no excuse now. And, and I think that's 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 you know that that availability is working really well. And I think that's also something that you know we're seeing now you know this this multidisciplinary and i guess a bit of a blending in between the profession 
organizations and that you know I, I attend a lot of multidisciplinary conferences and years gone by I might have only been the only chiropractor in the, in the room and I, I remember one particular conference it was a sports medicine conference actually uh, you know I was chatting to a physio during the lunch break and he said oh so you know how would you use this this stuff and I'm like well, what do you mean and he's like well how would you use it you know I was I think it was talking about a shoulder shoulder you know rehab or stuff I'm like oh well how would you use it? And he's like, well, you know, do this. I'm like, well, I'd do the exact same thing. And I think, you know, it was, it was again, it was this image in, in his mind that, you know, chiropractors only treat backs and, and necks and, and, and uh, where they're really, you know, that's, uh, we've, we're given in our five years of university, we're given enough anatomy training and, and uh, you know, we're taught about sort of stuff, certainly stuff outside the, outside the spine. And so we're, we're very well equipped to, uh, to deal with, uh, with those things. Um, and I think that nowadays, is, you know, where I was getting to was that, you know, because with this multidisciplinary education, there's a lot of blurring of the lines that, you know, that traditionally has been considered, oh, well, you know, if you've got sports injuries, well, then you, you only need to, you just need to see a physio. Whereas nowadays you've got osteo, you've got chiro, you've got myotherapy, you know, all these sort of blending in between the professions. And I think that that's that's a good thing. I think that you know because it's it's obviously for benefit of the of the, the patient um, in that you know the patient is getting then best evidence based care and doesn't matter who's delivering it. It just it just means that you know that the person in front of them is uh, is is well equipped to uh, to deliver parts of that you know that biopsychosocial approach. Um, so yeah, thankfully these days things have changed. You know, I go to seminars and, and uh, you know there are more chiropractors in in, in osteos in, in the room there, and and everyone just sort of you know treats you as a person and not necessarily as a oh yeah you've you've got this title and and uh, you know put, keep me off the, off to the side in a in a room. So um, yeah, thankfully things have uh, things have, have improved in that in that regard. It is amazing how some of these stereotypes uh, live on. I think even yesterday I was in one of the physiotherapy forums and just seeing them talk about how that, the way they talk about sort of getting osteopaths into their business and that type of thing. And, you know, for me, obviously having them both and, you know, teaching courses which have over 15 different professions come to it, there's really not a lot of difference between the good therapists, you know, mm. and maybe the, the older therapist or the, you know, less um, evidence-based therapists out there. Which probably leads me on to my next question, Luke. What are, what are the key skills do you think make someone a good therapist in the 21st century? I think communication is a really big one. Um, I, was, I was having this discussion recently on on another podcast and it was talking about, so yeah, you know, what is the what is the, the, the skill that you think, uh, you know, and especially for, for new grads um, is communication. I think that we weren't given enough of that um, you know, when I was at when I was at uni, I was given you know I think it was like a semester subject, and it was a bit of a joke really. Uh, it was more just to, to get through this subject. But once you're out there in the, in the real world and seeing patients, you realise the importance of that. And that's you know that's you know like I said, we've got uh, we've got two two eyes, two ears, and a mouth. You know, so we should be you know listening you know twice as much as, as what we're uh, we're talking. Um, so it's being a good listener is is part of communication. So it's letting a patient you know get it's just dump everything on you um, and uh, and just listening uh, and then, you know, having a conversation around that. And it's also then part of education as well too. So, you know, how you deliver, you know, the, the diagnosis and, and how you deliver, you know, what your treatment plan is and what you expect to see um, and also, you know, educating them around like I did with that runner early on today, educating them in terms of, you know, injury prevention and, and things that can stop them getting in that in that place in the first place. So, so yeah, you, you might have expected me to say magic hands and, and or a particular type of, uh, of magic technique, but no, communication really is a, is a big one. And I think that, you know, I look back and see where, you know, I haven't got the result that we, that we wanted to with a particular patient and I'm like, yeah, I probably could have communicated that a bit better and I still, you know, reflect on that these days. It, you don't get it right. 100% of the time and some people you just don't you just don't gel with is like yeah just didn't really feel like we we got that connection um and uh, and so that would be that would be the number one number one thing would be uh, would be communication yeah no i think that's a really uh, important thing uh, under um utilized i think or under focused on in clinical practice as well everyone focuses on the you know the skills in regards to the treatment or the training mm. or the assessment but uh communication you don't do that well you don't really mm. give yourself a chance at any other things there so communication is obviously a big part going into the future, especially probably as more technology comes into our practice. Mm. But where do you see you know the, the health profession in the ne over the next sort of ten to twenty years? So I think that um, I mean obviously now we've we've the last couple of years and and uh, through COVID we've seen a you know explosion in things like telehealth where, where people are you know talking like you and I and, and conducting uh, um, assessments and, and uh, you know, giving guidance and, and something I've done more than I ever have in the, in the last uh, last few years and certainly seeing the, the merits to, uh, to doing that. Um, I still think that, you know, face-to-face -face is, 
is uh, is my preferred method, but that's mainly because of what's what I've been trained with, and and uh, so we certainly weren't given any training on on telehealth when we went through uh, went through uni twenty years ago. Um, but um, I, I think that um, yeah, obviously that you know opening up now to to the, the wider world, and so not just now your, your local community, but you know, things like that. I think that's um, really exciting in terms of data um, and and wearables. You know, both you and I are pretty big in into our and to our objective data, and I think that's a, a really important thing. You know, I mentioned before, you know, and firstly, being able to, to diagnose what's what's going on, but in terms of also tracking tra tracking progression and tracking improvement. So thankfully, you know, advancements in technology in terms of their availability and also the expense, it's just getting cheaper and, and more more readily available. So I, I would think that, you know, in years to come, we've got these, uh, you know, everyone's using these wearables and, and we've got access to technology that are allowing us to sort of objectively assess and really get a really nice holistic um, view of, of the person that's in front of us so that then you know we can form comprehensive um, you know treatment plans and, and uh, uh, you know really get an, an optimal optimal outcome in that. So I see sort of that, that becoming more and more readily used as we've already been seeing in the last five to ten years. So I expect to see a, a you know gr larger growth than that, than that. And that almost just becomes the becomes the normal. Really, it's just like that's the minimum standard. This is what you need to uh, what you need to have. No, I think that's – and, look, I think that probably gets on to our second last question, Luke. We've got a big final question for mm -hmm. you today. But, like, you've already touched on lots of this stuff already. But what are the like, – the, if someone wants to take home three points from this discussion today, what are the three points that can help them bring themselves into the 21st century? Well, I think communication, you know, communication. And, and that's, uh, you know, the big turning point for me was around that, um, you know, the explain pain. A lot of that is, is you know, down to communication and listening and being a good listener through there. So I'd say – one, work on your, your communication skills. Um, I think two, you need to have some form of, of objective um, assessment uh, in what you're doing uh, and whether that's using technology or, or whether that's you know, using low-tech options, there's plenty of things out there and that blue thing on the floor there on the background there is, is an example, example of that there. Um, that would be the second thing. Um, and then the third thing I, I reckon would be, um, I guess, the acknowledgement of, of just the the... I guess that the multifactorial nature of you know of pain and 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 injury and that you, you need to be yeah uh, holistic in your approach to the to the individual so it's you know taking collecting all this this data if you like uh, interpreting that and then working out you know what's relevant to uh, to the, the patient that's uh, that's in front of you so um, I guess that comes part of you know critical thinking in in in, uh, in terms of that so they're probably the, the three sort of skills that I that I'd recommend for um for, for people and something to put, uh, put a lot of time into. I think something that's underutilised is that individual in front of you. So I think that's a really great point to finish on there, Lou. Yeah. Now, I mentioned there was one final question today, and I've been really excited to, to get to the bottom. This is something that I've really wanted to know for a long time. But how do you keep your hair looking <laughs> so fantastic with so much volume in it? Oh, mate, yeah, if I told you, I told you I'd have to, <laughs> I, I told you I'd have to kill you. So, but uh, mind you, you've got a good, a good bit of, uh, bit of, you know, cloth going up there in the, uh, the, the top there. So, looking, looking pretty good yourself, mate. But uh, no, no, it really is a, really is a, a, a well kept secret. But uh, thankfully, and my wife would testify to that that my, my hair routine is, is consists of just putting some product in my hair and giving it a, a dust. So it actually does not take too long to, uh, to go. But I'm, I'm probably thankful to my, my uh, grandfather for, for the head of hair. So it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's more down to uh, genes than it is uh, anything else, mate. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure. I believe you. It only takes, it takes a couple of seconds to put that together, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that on that note. So, um, yeah, look, thank you very much. If people want to find out more about you, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so probably best to find me on socials so they can find me on Instagram or uh, Instagram or Twitter uh, at Sports Chiro Luke. Um, they can more than welcome to, to email me uh, just at luke at healthhp.com.au uh, or where I'm, uh, where I'm based at uh, Health and High Performance in, uh, in, in Melbourne here. So, yeah, more than happy to uh, answer any questions or, or uh, that any of our listeners have got. But uh, no, I appreciate appreciate having me on today, mate. It's uh, yeah, obviously a, a privilege to, uh, to be the, the first car and hopefully one of, uh, of many to about many to come after me i've definitely got a great list of tyros ahead to get on the podcast into the future and uh super excited obviously got the matt running course launching this week actually so uh, enrollments close this sunday it's something i'm really excited to have you on board um, with the matt team as part of and um, i learned a lot going through the course and creating with you so i know that everyone else out there um you know will get a lot out from it as well so if you want to learn more uh, the links in the bio ahead to mattassessment.com
Thanks, mate. Yeah, we're very proud of what we've uh, what we put together. It's been a lot, a lot of work, um, but I'm, I'm really, really happy with how it's turned. It's been a yeah, certainly a labour of labour of love, and it's great to uh, to see it finally uh, finally be born. I guess. <laughs> no, you've driven it, mate, and you're helping the profession move into the 21st century, and we thank you for it. Thanks for joining us again today, Lou. Thanks, Kingy. Thanks, mate.